good day, and thanks for checking out the new Sportsline podcast here on CHCH. I'm Bubba O'Neill. Like guest Steve Foxcroft said earlier this week, if you can make it in Hamilton Hall in the Niagara, well, you can make it anywhere. And it's those teams, athletes, executives, and broadcasters who will be shining in the spotlight on the Sportsline podcast. Well, a bio of this individual reads an influential, accomplished competitor driven by the game and the business of sports. Now, I'm sure during his days of playing football at Western Washington University, he would have never forecasted that Southern Ontario would one day be his home. He's a multiple Grey Cup champion, a Canadian Football Hall of Famer, a CFL Coach of the Year, and even one time a TV analyst. Orlando Steinauer, always pleased to have you, and even more pleased to have you on the Sportsline podcast, partner. Yeah, man. I appreciate you having me, man. This is uh, this brings us back to uh, many years ago when we did a little bit of work on a different station. Yeah, so, different yeah. Station. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, it's great to have you here. Uh, I guess I got to catch up with you. I mean, the last time we chatted was, uh, I guess, kind of over the phone on radio after a playoff loss, and yeah. those can never be very, very easy, especially when you're. I'm the first guy you're talking to five minutes after the the final whistle I mean now that that's come around and the season is sort of getting ramped up a little bit how have you been <laughs> yeah well you know I've been well it's uh it's been different we you know we've had some shakeups, but you know all those things are the titles bubs but at the end of the day uh, this is a people business you know I'm a person you're a person and there's things that happen outside the show there's things that happen outside football so that's why I give the general overall statement things have been real well and I guess you've had some opportunities to get away from Tim Horton's field. Um, maybe your family don't like you being at home as much as yeah. you've been, maybe. Yeah. Like, what's that like? Well, it's I get to see the neighbors a little bit and, <laughs> and, and reintroduce myself. You know, I'm usually gone. And, and that's what the in the coaching realm just requires. So um, it is it is nice to be around the, the family, uh, you know, doing odds and ends of things and mm -hmm. you know being a dad being a husband doing all the all the fun things so uh, I'm enjoying it but at the same time it, it never really stops you know the season ends obviously you don't ever want to get used to to losing uh, it was a disappointment there at the end but there's always one champion and after that the work really begins you got to formulate you got to find a staff uh, you got to get personnel people back on board uh, therapy department all types of things so it really doesn't stop in December and then of course you lead right into the league meetings in January and then from there you got free agency around the corner Oops. when you were coaching how many hours a day were you in the facility you know, it varied. You know, I can say that there probably wasn't a day that it was uh, anything under 12. Um, that's just a, a standard thing. And um, but, you know, I think it varies. It, it varies. Sometimes there's short weeks is why I say there's short weeks. You might play two games in six days. You may you may actually have a uh, bye week so you can spread your work out a little bit. Um, if it's a regular seven day work week, we're meaning seven days between games, then that that also requires something. And then sometimes uh uh, you're hot and mm -hmm. things are rolling and and then sometimes you're not and so you do whatever the job requires I always think of the likes of a Dick Vermeil Hall of Fame coach Super Bowl champion and he had to leave the game for a little bit because he said he was spending up to 20 hours a day yeah. at the facility it can get stressful can it absolutely and I think as I've climbed up I saw that and you you do take examples of that and I love spending time with lifers in the business and just saying, you know, what is it that you might change and those types of things. And, and you listen to those. So you have to formulate your own because everything is not a cookie cutter model. One thing doesn't work um, as well at a different place that it might have worked for somebody else. But you still gather the information and those and those data points, if you will. And so I really put an emphasis on the, the work life balance and it's never going to be completely balanced, mm -hmm. but it is um, you have to create an environment that people want to belong and feel comfortable heading to a doctor's appointment uh, saying I'm having a you know what kind of day, mm -hmm. you know, and know that there's grace in that. There also is accountability. But at the same time, my goal was always to create an environment that people wanted to be. I didn't want people pulling in a parking spot taking a deep breath saying, how the heck am I going to get through this day? <laughs> there's no way they're going to understand because people life happens. And so, yeah, there's a job to do. And it kind of leads to, you know, what I did is I took over is I took everybody's title off the door mm -hmm. and every it just says their name, not what they do and not what, you know, we all know that we're held accountable 
to a job and a description that we're that that but at the end of the day we're people right. and so i really tried to uphold that in the good times and in the times that uh, were deemed by others maybe as not so good before we get to what you're re i will consider your new appointment when you have this time at home, do you get to kit back? Do you get to watch some NFL football? Like, what do you think of that Bills in Kansas City game? I think uh, I do. I have watched probably a couple more games than I normally would. Um, I always love watching playoff football, regardless. You kind of, but I'm I'm kind of a PVR guy now. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I record it. How can you PVR sports? Because I I like to start like 45 minutes late, turn off my phone, don't do anything, and zip through those commercials and zip through halftime and just watch ball. <laughs> and that's just kind of the way it is. And that way it still affords me time to uh, do the things that I have to do uh, at home uh, um, as a family person and then also what the job requires. In that Bills game, Tyler Bass misses that, what, I think 40-41 yard field goal for, yeah. wasn't for the win, but it would have put them in a tie situation to maybe go into overtime. Yeah. You've been a player and probably seen kickers miss yeah. players or kickers win games. Yeah. What does that feel like? And how, as a coach, do you approach a player like that because there's a belief that the kicker is the kicker they're by themselves they just <laughs> their only friend is the punter right right, right. They just don't practice with the rest maybe of the, the holder maybe the holder maybe the holder like how do you deal with that how do you deal with that individual especially in a situation where there is so much pressure on that one player and you're so used to them coming through and in the one opportunity they don't come through that's a fair question. I think it's different for each player. And I think you, it's hopefully the relationship that you've built up to that point and you respect the way he would prepare for those kicks. Some kick at net, some people, you know, I played with a, that's I late, but no, no, Prefontaine was the guy that I was around the most. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him as just an athlete that could kick. You know, he, he could do anything. He could throw the ball, he could run routes, he'd try to knock your head off. Um, he could kick off, he could punt. He was an athlete, and so he would just be like, if, if you will, one of the guys. Mm -hmm. And you could joke around with him, and then there's other ones. You know, I've played with a kicker who I'll leave unmentioned that walked around practice with earplugs in <laughs> and just had to be locked in. Mm -hmm. That was, And so that, there's two different extremes. And so in that moment, I always looked at it as this way, Bubs, as a, as a coach, is, is the player slash person, is this person prepared for the moment? That's all you can do as a coach. And if you can't look yourself in the eye and, and your team and the organization and say that you have prepared this person for an opportunity like this, um, then you, you got to reevaluate a little bit. That's just my opinion. Sure. Um, the CFL is unique because there are no kicking coaches per se. There's not that specialist, right? And so a lot of these players get better on their own and you kind of learn what they've adapted, what they like, and you support them in that. And then, of course, there's references uh, that you can that you can lean on. With that being said, um, there's so much mental that goes into it. You know, nobody goes out there trying to mess up. No, they they just don't. And this goes for every position. Uh, when it comes to kicking, you know, we try to do noisy field goals after practice. We circle people around. Mm -hmm. and we say, if you make it, uh, the team doesn't have to run. And you simulate things. And as fun as that may sound, th there's only so much you can do to prepare. You can't, you know, we put crowd noise cranked right. up. Uh, we'll do all types of things. But, you know, we, we offer them sports psychologists and or mental performance coaches. But at the end of the day, None of that matters. The person has to go out and perform. Right. So when you say, what do you do as a coach? You trust that the preparation has been enough to give this person the comfort to go out there and think of it as any other kick and go through. Uh, when you add elements of wind and cold and uh, moving on in the playoffs and people's livelihoods, some people are able to handle that a lot better than 70, others. 70,000 people watching you. Oh, yeah, and that. <laughs> So uh, there's a lot that goes into it, but at the end of the day, it's about support and not making it bigger than it is. Let's play a quick little game here, and, and we'll, see, we'll call it the, um, okay. the picture association feeling game and tell me what you feel. Let's bring up a picture here, that I, and I want you okay. to, to tell me, what, when you look at that guy, what, what, what do you think? What, what, is, what was that guy going? What was going on in his head back then? I can remember that. That was... 
Brian Timmis Field, practice field. I just think of my teammates. I think of Ron Lancaster. I think of uh, – I'm laughing because of the Adidas patch. I think I probably thought I was a little bit big time there. I'm, I'm laughing at the at the hairdo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had some good hair. Now. It's fly. Had, Very fly. Yeah, I had some, had some good hair. Uh, that was – that was a prime. That was a – I remember the cha- I think of challenge. I know this was I'm trying to make it quick here. I think of a challenge because I was an all pro corner that got moved to halfback. And I think that was a, a 1998 possible halfback picture where I was trying to be the best at a new position. Mm-hmm. Uh, I relish those moments. I, it's too bad it's a young man's game because I still would probably try to run down there. W- would you? I think so. I, here's the thing. I don't miss the training, though. No I don't, one does. I don't miss the training, <laughs> but at game day, uh-huh. man, I, I I don't know if that ever leaves, right? But I do relish, I do relish, and really love passing on mm-hmm. what was passed to me and and things that I inherited along the way. And when that light bulb goes off for somebody else, that's my game day. Those '98 and '99 teams. I mean, the, the Ticats are a big deal now. Yeah, but I mean. When you guys won in '99, like there was a massive parade here in Hamilton. Yeah. Like, like it was crazy. Like Hitchcock, Morielli, uh, Flutie, McManus, so many personalities on that team. Yes. And you put it all together. You put it together, and you know, wow. When you think of that, I can still think. I still have a picture in my desk at home. I know. I can tell you who was in my car. Calvin Tiggle and Frank West. Mm-hmm. And that's how much of a memory it stays in. And I could remember that was that was a party. That was a morning party. That felt that felt great. And it's gonna happen again. Mm-hmm. You know, I know um I there's so much that goes into it, you know, from Mike McCarthy assembling it, Ron Lancaster, Don Sutherland, uh just the buy-in, the buy-in and the willingness to push each other. So every now and again you get a group of people that you can actually hold accountable. Mm-hmm. Uh, internally, we could do an hour show. We'd have to, you have to invite me for back sure. for more shows, right? But what I mean by that is, it, there's there's times when there's a special thing where uh, discipline and um, organization doesn't always have to come from the top. Mm-hmm. That it happens from the inside out, and that's the, that's how it happened. By the time Lancaster wanted to talk about something or we got to tighten this up, it's already handled. <laughs> it's already handled, and yeah, that doesn't mean that it it wasn't. Uh, always rosy but when it came to ball and hanging out and just doing things that came natural man it was second to none other than um the the rothman's blue cigarettes which i know you were not a part of no what what what, what did ron lancaster mean to you uh in terms of his head coaching and maybe did he rub off on you a little bit he was a different cat like, but he was a special cat boy he was and i just remember his right hand guy, can I also, you know, both of them rest in, you know, rest well. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ron Lancaster and his right hand guy, Bernie Custis. And I just remember Bernie always sitting there and Lancaster. The things that I learned from him were things that are important, he handled. He didn't delegate. So, for example, cutting a player releasing a player waving a player whatever little adjective you want to add on to that he did it breakfast check he didn't send an intern or anybody he did it running a scout team he held the cards conditioning he ran it so that i learned but he's a guy that we could be talking like this Mm -hmm. and then i was feeling good about life and then the next morning right by me (laughs) and i'm like what could I have done in those last 12 hours to elicit that? And it wasn't anything personal. It's who he was. Mm -hmm. And then he'd catch you off guard. I was the only guy leading the stretch line. And he's like, hey, oh. I go, yeah, what's up? He goes, this is when he came over from Edmonton. It doesn't take you long to uh, dislike those people down the QEW, does it, when you're here? I said, no, coach, it doesn't at all. (laughs) So he had a little sense of humor that he liked to show out to certain people. But um, I guess the little general uh, was for a reason. Um, I could go on and on and and, happy to come on and and talk story sometime with with everybody. But I learned a whole bunch. Some of stuff I didn't didn't take with Mm -hmm. But a lot of it, and of of it, uh, I did. It's always stuck in the back of my mind, and I really respected how you know. I think his first two years of coaching, I I want to say he was two and something, mm-hmm. 
uh, in Sask. And then I, he had some decent times in Edmonton. And then he came here and overhauled the offense, had no ego, kept a in lot a hurry. of hurry. Yeah, kept a lot of the defense intact, brought Sudsy back. Credit to Sudsy for coming to a place that booted him out. And it didn't matter. It was about winning. And what can we get accomplished? I respect that about Ron. Let's see another picture here and you tell me again what it means to okay. you. Okay. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Champion. Player of the year. 23 school records. Uh, I don't know how many double-doubles she had. That's that's my wife, Gina, there. What an impressive thing. Uh, I think, as you can tell, there's only one couple of strings left to be cut, and that's for the head coach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, super proud of her and her journey. She went on to play in Australia professionally. Um, before, I think it was the WBL mm -hmm. and before the WNBA mm -hmm. and did, did an outstanding job there. So, uh, she averaged 18 points and 13 boards a game in those days. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. And as you said, set double digit school records. Yeah. She was she a better athlete than you? Stop it. Come I'm on. I'm just asking. She might be. Well, it depends who you're asking. Well, you athlete, got me on cable. Athlete, the answer of the is, athlete of the decade. Yeah. I think the AD had a crush on her or something. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I made it all-decade team, too. No, she, she's a good athlete. She ran track. She high jumped. She played volleyball. She could do a lot of things. Um, she really turned into a, to an outstanding basketball player. So that that's what that reminds me of. She put in a lot of hard work. That was the result mm -hmm. of a lot of hard work. That's what that picture says to me. Was this like a high school or a college sweetheart kind of thing? Is that how? College. I met her my uh, my sophomore year. Okay. Uh, of of let's see, university, college. I'm getting the terms back and forth. Yeah. Next picture, please. Okay. This is fun. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Whoa. You're the only guy. Uh, yeah, everybody's gonna see my other side. That gets emotional. <laughs> um, that's why I breathe right there. That's that's the team. That's the family. That's what I've been blessed with. Mm -hmm. That uh, I was able to be inducted because of them mm -hmm. and the support. So uh, that's uh, that's that's packed with a lot. That's probably a half hour show. Mm -hmm. So that uh, that's a special time. Uh, I looked at that. That's um, that's reflection mm -hmm. uh, of just. You know, proud moment for them and and proud moment for me, my grandparents, everybody along the journey mm -hmm. that, that helped me get there. When you start playing sports, you play, you love the game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I, you know, went to the Detroit Lions and got released and then ended up in Ottawa when they were the Rough Riders, still found that a little odd that there was only <laughs> n nine teams and two teams had the same name. <laughs> same but name. That's another topic. Um, <laughs> And then all of a sudden, you, you, yeah, you're pretty good at it. You're just trying to be the best you can be. Then you say, well, wait a minute. Um, how can I help somebody else be the best they can be? Wait a minute. This is kind of fun. How, how can, let's, let's try to get our name etched in history. Mm -hmm. and, and then all of a sudden, it's over. And then you have to have people ref reflect and say, now, wait a minute. I think you're one of the best to do, ever do this. Um, as you can tell, mm -hmm. it's hard to come up with the words. It means a lot. Uh, there's a lot of people that should be proud. Um, I'm just happy that I was able to make a lot of people proud, take the talents that I was given, harness it, and you know, try to become the best version that I could be, and not just as a player, but as a person. Two things that come when I see that family picture of you, and of course that was you being inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. One, at least from what I read, was it Gina that told you to coach? Yes. So, yeah, I, after the playing career, I said, you know what? I don't want to be year to year anymore. I just personally, I was, I was drained. I was burnt out on just providing for the family, not knowing if I was going to be over here, over there, this province, moving schools. And so I said, you know what? Let me take a year and see. And, you know, I got the chance to do TV and radio, and I really enjoyed it, you know. and You were good. I, I appreciate it. And, I, well, it was, the funny thing I would I can remember is, you know, credit to Ivanka and, and uh, you know, even Brad and all those guys and, and just the opportunity. And I remember 
um, you know, just Sportsnet folks. That's what that, that's my old yeah, shopping ground. Yeah, right? and, you know, and and, and Martin and mm-hmm. all these people are just great to me. And mm-hmm. and I just went in there as a rookie, mm-hmm. and I remember when it wasn't a live hit. I remember doing a hit and saying, "Hey, I want to I want to watch it," and they just look at me and I'd say, "No, this is like tape to me. I want to watch tape. I want to be better. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to be like you guys. Like I'm a rookie. I'm not. You know, I got an opportunity. And I thought, you know what? Let me." Let me jump into this and see what see what I could do. You know, radio was natural for me because I was always there, but TV's different. You know, it's harder to stare down the barrel. You know, whichever one, there it is. There's a red light. I'm looking for the red light. You know, and, and, and that takes practice and time and making it feel natural, but I was really starting to get into it. And then um, I got renewed and they wanted to know. And then Jim Barker called and said, hey, would you like to interview to be the DB job? And I thought, sure. And... Um, so, you know, if I was going to be able to call highlights or not, I didn't know. So I was actually signed a contract with a company, Cintas, C-I-N-T-A-S, and accepted a job. And I was still going to do the TV and radio part-time unless it became a full-time thing. And I interviewed Jim Barker, offered me the job across the desk. And I went home and I just said to Gino, hey, what do you think? You know, and she just kind of looked at me like this and said, you're a coach and she she knew it so credit to her for pushing me into that way everybody else always said that Mm -hmm. but I was ready to try something else and try to perfect that and be the best that I could be at that and so she did push me into that I also think of the three girls there they're all athletes too yeah and now was that something because of the two of you you know we never really pushed it on any of them to be honest with you now it what happens is there's things like PE classes and things and you hear things and um and so yeah Kiana really wanted to continue it and we coach see that's my thing basketball is my passion right we Mm -hmm. you know we might have coached a couple of provincial championships and Mm -hmm. things like that and you know that was as a defensive back coach and as a coordinator I was able to do that more in the off season right and so we did a lot of basketball coaching and I ran basketball camps at Western Washington and I refereed uh, my way through college and, and did that in university. So um, they're pretty naturally athletic, but we didn't really push it. I mean, the other thing is, is they're extremely artsy. They can pick up instruments and play them, drums, you know, flutes, clarinets. You know, Gina can play the guitar. Um, you know, I tried to do that one. That's a little side note. It wasn't very fun. COVID grabbed me myself a guitar. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mike Filer tried to help me. Oh. Sent me some CDs. Uh, I could strum. I can't play. What, At Leonard Skinner? <laughs> Baby steps. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out to show another side of me here. Okay. All, right. All right. Pretty good woodworker, too, by the way. Um yeah, they just they just they love they love to play, but they love other things too. Mm-hmm. They love a lot of other things that, um, outside of anything athletic and sports. So just extremely proud of them as people. So there's the assistant coaching days with the Argonauts, the assistant coaching days with the Tiger Cats. Um, you leave, you leave, and go to Fresno State for a year. Yeah, but then you come back. Under you know the likes of I guess a, a June Jones and uh, uh, Ken Austin were you know were running the organization at the time, and then you become a head coach. Yeah, you become a head coach and you have this immediate success. You end up being coach of the year. Did it just seem so easy? Uh, well, I can just say that you know things happen in life. I got to give Jeff Tedford uh, a ton of credit also for this. You know we went down there and and turned the program around in a year from double digit losses to double digit wins you know we had a top 15 defense and i really learned another way to turn a program around and for from a lifer that believed in certain things and um yeah we'll have to do another another episode on just the coaching part but um when i had an opportunity to come up with lifers uh like june jones jerry glanville Mm -hmm. and learn from them and see a way it was just an opportunity that i couldn't pass up plus i always had a desire to work on the offensive side of the ball to help me be better right like all i did was study offense for 20 years you know and now i had a chance to actually not get a clinic talk but actually submerge myself so the opportunity to learn from those guys being a uh, the a receivers coach it it just seemed like 
sometimes life's about timing or maybe all of it is. Mm -hmm. And I just had to seize that moment and that opportunity. And I didn't know. I mean, I'm telling the first thing that I could, I didn't have bubs when I started off is I didn't have head coaching experience. So if you look at how I assembled that first staff, I surrounded myself with experience. Mm -hmm. And, but at the same time, I was able to sit right where the players sat. I could always look them in the eye and say, I've been there. I've been exactly where you're at. I understand how your legs feel. I understand when you feel like you're being wronged. I understand wanting playing time, being in the practice roster, what we refer to as the waiting room. And I just, you know, that was what I brought that other coaches couldn't bring. They didn't play 12 years. So it was a nice mix there. And then it was, okay, sure, coaching is just a piece of it. But what do you stand for daily behind the scenes? The three hours that you see on game day is great. Oh, he made this call. He didn't make that call. How can we do this? Oh, he seems aggressive. Oh, I like his sideline demeanor. All that gets critique. But it's everything behind the scenes that lead up to the game day Mm -hmm. preparation. And it was very interesting because after I got the job and it was just these fluorescent lights and I thought, oh, man. Here we go. What are we doing? And now everything crosses your desk. One bus or two. Do you want to eat? Do you not want to eat? How do you want to do this? What about training camp? When do you want the coaches in? When do you, and you're like, whoa, there's no prep for that. You do it. And so I did feel prepared, mm-hmm. overly prepared in some aspects. And some things, you, there's just no way. And then you don't know how it feels after a loss. Right. Yeah, you feel for your coach as a coordinator, as a position coach. But then it's on you. And the media right after. Hey. What about this? What about that? Not just the loss, but why'd you do this? Yes, you're in that boat. You're in that boat. And you have to learn to get used to it. And you have to stand for something. And because you're on stage every day mm-hmm. in front of your team, in front of the organization, your representative of it, uh, a city that wants to wants to win. But then you got to you can't appease everybody no matter what somebody's going to not agree with you and you have to stand for something and that's what I learned and so when I sat in a room with June Jones and all these other coaches and Robin Ross with 40 years of coaching experience and Jeff Reinbold and I said hey this is what it's going to be I'm sure they were like oh boy here's this young whippersnapper I've heard these ones before (laughs) you know and all I asked them to do was you know wherever they've been nobody's been undefeated Um, There's lots of ways to do things. I'm going to lean on you for some things, but this is the way we're going to do it. And the thing is, before I hired them, they already knew all that stuff. But when you get everybody together and you kind of say, this is what it's going to be, I'm going to be extremely flexible in a lot of areas, but these are kind of the non-negotiables. This is what we stand for. To their credit, they bought in. They were the first buy-in. And I'm leading all up to the success, if you will. Still not sure what that means. Um, But the high-achieving team in 19, Uh, The buy-in started with the staff and the organization and, you know, everybody from the personnel department, they said, okay, we'll rally. We'll we'll see this through. And it's got to be the one thing that I think people get, it's easy to file or follow a chain of command in a hierarchy. That's easy. Mm -hmm. And it's withstood the test of time. However, when you can get people to willingly, that's the word I feel like people leave out. When they willingly follow, I think you've got a great opportunity. And these people willingly followed and were willing to try something new in, in some aspects. And once we, once, so now when the team came, we were bonded mm-hmm. organizationally, internally, we were bonded. So we were robbing the same train. We were singing the same song. And when they came in, they felt it. They didn't hear it or just see it. They felt it. And so they bought in and then we had talent and those type of things. And then you add the X's and O's. Then you get to the game day and you have the undefeated home Mm -hmm. record. You have uh, franchise record, 15 wins, 15 wins. Um, Yeah, the big one eluded us. We don't run from that. But at the same time, the joy that we brought when people left the stadium 10 times that were like, hey, that team, that's the rep- that's what it is. That's the pride and tradition of Thai Cat football, mm-hmm. of Hamilton Tiger Cat football, you know, uh, is special. And it, it not to be taken lightly. So, so many things went into when I went up there as the coach of the year. That's why I spoke the way I spoke, mm-hmm. I because that was exactly how it happened authentically. And it's funny that you bring up the big one. 
and it and it, you're right it covering the team from a media aspect and yeah. just watching the wins and the way you would pull out wins and then a quarterback goes down and then another guy that we've never heard of comes in there and just continues thing Dane Masoli the questions who are you going to play like but every screw you turned was right it seemed to be correct every decision that you made every gamble you made on third down everything's going right, right. and it's all ending up in victories I'm with you as a media member in Calgary in the Grey Cup, and I'm talking to other media members, and of course there's a conversation, and you know, you know, are they going to win? Is your team going to win? And of course it becomes becomes all of a sudden I'm the Hamilton media guy, yeah, you know, and guys like Steve Milton, and you can't help it because the rest of the guys from the country are asking you because you know a little bit more, you've seen a little bit more, and I'm saying to people I can't see them losing. Right. Right. So I was confident. I was actually when you guys stormed out of the out of the locker room at McMahon Stadium to get hit the field. I was right there nice. and I could feel the energy. Yeah. I, you know, I'm a medium member, but I felt like a part of the team. I was so pumped up. Right. Anyway, so I go upstairs and watch a game. And of course, the game goes nowhere like we expected it to. Yep. The hardest thing I've, I've been in doing television, sports television for Geez, over 30 years now. Okay. The hardest thing I have ever done in my career was asking you guys questions in the locker room at McMahon Stadium after a Grey Cup loss. Yeah. The tears, the disappointment, the shock, the bewilderment. Uh, I think I think Aaron Govashili was the guy running the media at the time. Yeah. I think we hugged. Mm-hmm. That kind of disappointment. And we just were talking about the Bills there and, T- and Tyler Bass. What is that? What does that kind of disappointment do, like for character? I think for each person, it's probably a little bit different. And it's funny when you're saying that I'm I'm seeing visuals of McMahon Stadium, and I remember doing, I think I might have been doing TSN or something after the game, but I don't even remember what I was saying here because all I saw was Bob Young over here, and him standing there. And boy, I don't like letting people down, let alone a city. And you mentioned your hug with uh, with Gogo. That's all I could do to Bob. I didn't have any words for him. I just went over to Bob and I, and I hugged him. And that, uh, that's a vivid memory, right? And it's, you know, from as a player or whatever, you're used to coming through. And you prepare for that. And your mind doesn't enter anyway. However, this is sport. And it's a zero-sum game. And there's always a winner and a loser. And, you know, I know you're speaking to how do you, how does it build character? I think sometimes it's over time. Like sometimes, you know, people reflect over, you know, you let's reflect over the five years I was the head coach or the DC. And, and sometimes it takes a year or two to reflect, to really understand what it is, right? People want the answer right then mm-hmm. in a press conference or in a season ending thing. And, and you're just getting that moment in time you may not be getting the truth. You know, some of the best things are, are going to be reflected over time. Sure. So, or reflected upon over time. So, uh, I can't speak for everybody else. I can just say that it, uh, in the beginning, you know, I know some people give you the, the saying, oh, it made me super hungry for the next year. No, it was, it, every year is different. And you don't know when you're going to be back. I, I was in, I think, four straight East finals as a player. Uh, in Toronto and we came through one time and it, that's just what it is and I, I don't know I still can't tell you if it made me stronger if it made me work harder or whatever I just enjoyed thinking O'Shea's probably working out I better go work out <laughs> or nobody's gonna outwork me that's what I could control I'm not getting outworked People can run faster and jump higher and have all these other things, but you're not gonna outwork me. And then I'm gonna work smarter than you. So while you're working harder, I'm working smarter and we're gonna get to the same spot. And it's those type of things that it does. And that's kind of my reflection afterwards is, okay, this team will never be the same. Coaching staff, personnel, players, it won't be the same. That's the hard part. It, it is hard, it is hard. And I, you know, I think that's, you know, let me go down this rabbit hole just for a second. It's like. In football, you know, the team that won the Grey Cup this past year was 11 and 7. There's 30 wins between Winnipeg and Toronto. And they didn't win. Now, in every other sport, most other sports, I shouldn't say every, but the majority of them, you're going to play 
four out of seven, mm -hmm. three out of five, two out of three, whatever it looks like. Major League Baseball for a long time was division winners, right? That's right. 162 games. Imagine finishing two games away from first and you're done. Well, I, that's why I love the wild card. Because if I finish within five games after playing 162, I'm probably almost as good as you. Probably. Now, it depends how you view it, but I, I, I believe I'm in that conversation. So play your way in. So all I'm saying is football is not like that. Do the Dolphins uh, beat the Chiefs on dry turf? We'll never know. But I'm just saying, if they played three out of five, if you played in a warm weather environment and mm -hmm. cold weather, and then you went to a neutral site, football's not like that. Mm -hmm. You just have to be better on that day. Does anybody expect nine turnovers in an East final? No, because there was no signs of that. But there's one champion. So you don't take away from anybody that's the champion. That's the beauty of the CFL is there's been a lot of great cup champions at 8 and 10, 11 and 7. Being the best in the regular season is that's all it is. And so, you know, maybe there's a day in football where it's two out of three. You know, you play. Well, they used to have that, they used to have that crazy two-game total point madness back back in the early 80s, but I don't know about that. But Yeah, well, I, I, you know, maybe maybe it's a home and away in a neutral site for the for the champs, you know. I'm just saying that in football, you're not afforded. It's, it's right then. Right. And on that day, Winnipeg uh, was better. And, uh, and, you know, fortunately, I've been on some Grey Cup champion teams where we were better. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2012, when I was coaching with the Toronto Argonauts, we were 9-9. Nine and nine. And I think we lost five of six in the middle of the year. Doomsday. But it, at the end of it, you know, the 100th Grey Cup champion is, are the Toronto Argonauts. So that's the beauty of the CFL in the league. Um, the disappointment never leaves. But if you can't take the journey, if you're defined by the scoreboard, you got to find a new profession. Yeah, that's maybe how you get extensions and stuff, but that has nothing to do with the person and, and what you believe and, and, and your standards that you're upholding from the inside out because otherwise you're too high and too low. Mm -hmm. you're, there has not been an undefeated team, so that means you're probably going to lose. Right. And guess what? Nobody's going to like it. The city, the owners, the everybody, you know, nobody's going to like it. How do you deal with adversity? I think that's the key. So let's fast forward to modern day where we are right now. And I don't know how I'm going to, at least as a media person, not call you Coach O because you're not the coach anymore. You're the <laughs> president. You're the, the president of football operations. And boy, that's got a nice little ring to it. Um, you know, a lot of what we've talked about right now is about you coaching and you leading men and preparing men and getting them ready for the game day and the game day experience um, and, and dealing with the media. This is going to be a different task for you. Are you going to be able to, I mean, obviously you're going to be able to do it, but is this going to be a real hard transition for you? We'll see. Let's do this show this time next year. Right. Um, I'm excited, mm -hmm. honestly, like, because it's a new challenge. It's no different from moving from corner to halfback, halfback to free safety. I'm going to be the best at what I do. I'm going to be the best assistant head coach to June Jones I could be. I'm going to be the best DB coach. Uh, for Scott Milanovic. I was going to be the best defensive coordinator for Kent Austin. I was going to be the best defensive coordinator for Jeff Tedford. And I'm going to be the best at this. There's no trophy for the best GM, for the best president of football operations. There's no Anna Stuckus award. But I want Scott Milanovic to be the coach of the year. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm looking at. So I have a new team, and that is the video coordinator, the therapy department. Um, they're going to raise their level. And we're going to pick it up. And it, I just happen to be a guy who can coach. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've done it a decent job of it. So maybe I'm throwing deep balls to the DBs as a president. I'm not going to be a glass ceiling guy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be present. I'm going to be available. I'm going to be there for all of that. But I'm also going to, behind the scenes, get everything else uh, and be able to give uh, undivided attention to things other than coaching. Because when you're coaching, you got to prep the meeting, run the meeting. Um, do the media, do those things. It's now, how can I help Scott Milanovic in his second time around make this thing happen and be Grey Cup champions in 2024? Ed Hervey in his third rung, how can he get back to, to hosting or hoisting a Grey Cup? I want Ed to be the best that he can be. 
you know, Drew Almain, Spencer Zimmerman, Spencer Boom, all these people. Like, I have a new team. Mm -hmm. So that's what I am. I'm a leader of people. Mm -hmm. And the title doesn't matter. I've been empowered and I'm not taking it lightly and I'm, and I'm fired up, as you could tell. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, that's, what get, that's what gets me going. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, my office is right next to Scott's. We want to talk some ball, let's talk some ball. I'm going to have that experience um, as a president, right? But like I said, there's no titles on the door. Mm -hmm. Anybody can walk through, they're going to see, oh, and uh, and that's and that's what it's about. So those guys are going to see me as their head coach. Right. And uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. Do while I miss the field, yeah, I'll bet you I will. I'm, I might have to have some headsets on on game day. We have and I'll do whatever it is that Scott and Ed need me to do. I really um, I, I want to be a service to them. Mm hmm. Um, at the same time, I think I have a lot to offer um, because my attention was divided before and now it's undivided. And so I'm excited at the new structure. I'm excited for 2024. I'm excited for free agency. And, uh, you know, I think we've built a strong foundation there. The environment is solid. Uh, and I just want I didn't want somebody to step in and have it be mushy. Right. I want to be, be able to put their stamp on it, springboard it, bounce ideas off me. Uh, both X's and O's, culturally, environmentally, and then uh, let's see what happens. Well, I, Coach, <laughs> see, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, because you are a leader of men. I have talked to enough players and women, and women as well. And women, well, I'm well, a leader. I I, 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 is it, are you a leader of your household? Those four ladies. Well, now nah, yeah, I'm, those four ladies. I'm a leader of people. <laughs> How about that? A leader of people would say, and I think that's going to carry you a long way in your new role. And I'm certainly looking forward to, to, to maybe even seeing you a little bit more, not so because you're always focused on the field, and especially when we do stuff with the Tiger Cats Audio Network as well too. But yeah. before we go, okay. there's one other question, and there was, I mean, we popped up on the on the podcast some what we call fun facts about individuals. So let me end the end okay. on this. And I heard I, I've been told by a secret source uh -oh. that you have a fascination with the vacuum. You like to vacuum a lot. Okay. What, what is that? What, what, you like to vacuum. A lot of people don't like to vacuum. You apparently you do. Like, do I like to vacuum? I like things clean, neat. <laughs> I want offices kept like we want to be Grey Cup champions. Um, here's, here's the way I look at it. I'll tell you where. So I could see where the perception and the optics would, they would think, but Here's, here's where it is. It's, it's kind of my leadership way and that nothing's beneath me. So for example, um, I might see a coffee stain that's spilt and I see people walking, stepping over it. Even though the carpet cleaners may be coming on Friday, if it's Monday, I'm gonna get the Bissell out. <laughs> And I'm going to get that coffee stain The up. Bissell, he even knows the name. Oh, now, yeah. I can notice other sides. Like, I'm not just a coach now, you know. That's the title. Like, like I like, I'll sweep, I'll vacuum, I'll straighten up, I'll hang pictures. And you can ask. And, and so do some oh, more. Oh, I heard that. I heard about this. So that, that I'll do whatever I expect other people to do. I'll, show, I'll model that. I'll do that. And it's not beneath me. That is, that is what is, that's what it requires. And so if somebody happened to come around the corner and saw me sweeping or on my hands and knees, getting a coffee stain up, or I might walk in their office and get it. Um, then yeah, if they saw it from there, they'd say, this guy must like to vacuum or carpet clean. <laughs> so, um, I like to do things the quote unquote right way and, uh, model what it is that I expect from others. Always setting the good example sounds like a good president to me. All right. Coach I appreciate Joe. it. I appreciate you. Thanks for your time, man. Appreciate I look you. forward to the next one. Absolutely. Appreciate you coming on in the yeah. Sportsline podcast, folks. Hey, if you uh, if you have a sports idea or a story with a local twist, folks, I certainly want to hear from you. Now, if your local team deserves some recognition, you have an athlete that deserves a platform, or you just have a sports opinion to share with me, the Sportsline podcast wants you. Contact us at many of the CHCH social media platforms. Please subscribe to the sports line podcast on tiktok youtube and hit that thumbs up or five star button so you always get the latest edition for the outstanding hands and minds that make this production possible thanks for hanging out and we'll see you tomorrow